Good morning. It's hard to say good morning with a mask on. I know that. Sorry about that. Um, it's a privilege to be with you uh, today. It's a privilege to be with you every, every, every Sunday, honestly. Um, this is, as long as we've been here, this has been uh, a church of great uh, kindness to me and my family. So thank you. Um, this morning, if you'd like to turn to God's Word, it's in the bulletin. Or you can turn your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians. This is a very brief passage, uh, but packed. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. And we read there, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Let's pray with me. Our Father in heaven, as we consider today your gracious gift, of thanksgiving, and how much you are the giver of all good things. We humbly thank you for the greatest gift you have given to us, free and undeserved salvation through the redemptive sacrifice of your Son, Jesus Christ. May your praise be always on our lips, and may your joy ever in our hearts. Amen. Well, Brad asked me a couple weeks ago to preach this week, give him a, little, give him a, a well-deserved break with his with this, uh, college kids, and, and I said, sure, that'd be, that'd be great. And uh, my first thought was, um, after he said, you know, Phil, someone with your age and experience could probably lend a lot of insight about Thanksgiving, and, and I thought, well, that's very charitable of Brad to think that. And uh, my, my first thought was, hasn't he ever heard of the term grumpy old man, you know? <laughs> But, and, uh, and it's kind of true that as we get older, and some of you who are a little bit older, um, that we tend, as we grow, uh, to either become more joyful and more thankful and more grateful people, or we tend to become more bitter and hurt and vengeful people, people that feel like we got the wrong end of the stick or the short end of the stick. Um, so you might ask yourself this morning, are, are you growing more thankful as you get older, regardless of your age? Or are you growing more joyful? Or are you growing more resentful? Are you bitter? Now, the second thought that came to my mind was, you know what? This is really bad timing for Thanksgiving. This, <laughs> maybe we ought to postpone Thanksgiving uh, because, you know, I mean, you know what's going on with Thanksgiving here. Uh, I tend to like, I think it's my favorite holiday. It always has been just because we had a lot of my cousins would come, my grandparents would come, uh, at least one set of them. And you'd get up in the morning, smell the turkey. My mom could make really good turkey. My wife, my wife makes great uh, turkey and with the special dressing. Everybody has a special dressing. Cranberry sauce, I don't know if that's your tradition, it is ours. Mashed potatoes. Sweet potatoes, or as in the South, as they call them, yams. Uh, the anticipation and joy of just being with your family members and having fun. I was thinking, uh, sitting there when Brad was talking about harvest and praying, and, you know, we didn't grow up with a lot of money, but we laughed a lot. We had a great time together as a family. So just those communi communal times as families, Thanksgiving, there's, it's really hard to beat. Um, and of course, watching the Cowboys play. Every, that's, that's, an, that's an aside, you've got to be a Cowboys fan. But, but uh, this year is going to be different, won't it? Some of you are undoubtedly asking yourselves, how can you be thankful for such a lousy year? Possibly the worst year of your lifetime. How many of you think this is the worst year you've ever had? <laughs> a few, okay, maybe, okay, maybe I'm the only one, okay. Um, but what do we even have to be thankful for? Well, uh, give you, I'll give you a few examples to refresh your memory. We face the illness and death of loved ones. The coronavirus lockdowns, they're still going. Canceled religious services all around the country. Locked churches. Isolation. Unemployment, not to mention wildfires. The riots that are literally ripping apart our cities. Devastating hurricanes, massive flooding. Young people looking at the loss of potential relationships and futures. Youngsters going back and forth from online to inline, or online to in-person classes. 
rising domestic abuse, drug abuse, and skyrocketing depression. The litany of woes seems endless, and maybe for those of you in my generation, it seems that we're witnessing the loss of our country. The values and traditions that we grew up venerating, our flag, our constitution, the most basic Judeo-Christian moral value seems like they're going down the drain. Even our favorite sports seem poisoned. The results of the most contentious election in our history are still pending today. And regardless of the outcome, we'll still end up in a divided country where half the people don't trust the other half and where no one trusts media or politicians. I called my, one of my sisters yesterday and just to check in with her, she lives in Florida, and um, I said, hey, how, how are you doing? We caught up with her kids. And, I wished her a happy Thanksgiving and talked a little bit. And I said, what do you think about this election? <laughs> Bad question. And she said, well, she said, we live in a purple household. And I said, what do you mean? She said, well, I'm blue and Jeff is red. And, and uh, we haven't talked to each other in a couple of weeks very much. I mean, it, she sounded a little bit tense. Like she was ready to bring the crocking down on, on Jeff there, my, my, my good brother-in-law. But uh, that's kind of a picture of... Our lives this year isn't division and rancor. They'll get over it. They're a good couple. But. So the passage for today really helps us to focus on the remedy for this, doesn't it, in spite of this. And it's by being thankful, by making thankfulness itself a part of our very being. Because as we read in the passage, it's God's will for us to be thankful and for thankfulness and joy and praying. They're all interconnected they go together like pieces of, of a puzzle, Brad mentioned. Joy flow, flows out of, only can flow out of a thankful heart. And prayer is the way we convey that thanks back to God. It's very circular. Remember, our main purpose as Christians is to glorify God and enjoy God. And that can only happen if we're thankful. You can't be thankful if you're grumpy or sad or angry, can you? The title of this sermon, that thanksgiving is an act, and thankfulness is an attitude. So it takes both the action and the mental attitude. It's what we do, and it's who we are. Just think of overhearing maybe a visitor today leave the church and say, man, that's the most joyful, thankful, prayerful group of people I've ever been around. Wouldn't that be great? As opposed to, boy, they sure have a good book of church order. And we're unlikely to hear that. We do have a good book of church order, but much better the first. Now, if I just stop right now, just this morning for a second, it's not hard at all for me to be thankful. I'm thankful I came in today to a warm building. I've got a great group of people. I know most of you uh, by, by name. I love you. And just being in fellowship with people who you love and who love the same God you love and come here for communion and service. Um, it's a wonderful thing. I hear beautiful music performed to excellence, to be able to hear a good uh, gospel sermon week after week after week, celebrate communion. You can just start thinking. I mean, the thanks, are, thanks don't come hard, do they? And today's passage deals with that golden triad of thankfulness and joy and prayer. They're inextricably connected. Even linguistically, the Greek word ekaristeo means being thankful. It's the same word we get for Eucharist. It's the exact same word in Greek, just transliterated to English. It just means being thankful. So when we have communion, it just means thanks. That's right, communion is the way that we corporately give thanks to God every time we observe it, in our case, every week. Remember, Jesus gave thanks at the Last Supper before feeding the 4,000 he gave thanks. Paul gave thanks often for the faith and the salvation of the churches he ministered to. In Revelation, the living creatures in the heavenly realm give thanks continuously to God. Thanks is part of who we are as God's believing people as his chosen people. The root of the word comes from charis. It's where we get C-H-A-R-S. It's where we get charity from. It's 
It means grace. It's closely related to kara, which means joy. They're all connected in the Greek, not by happenstance. The experience of gladness, that's what joy is. It's where the word charismatic is derived from. So hopefully you're, be, you're able to connect the dots between thankfulness and joy. They go together. And if you're here this morning just checking out Christianity or if you're online and you're just kind of listening and, and maybe don't take God's word at, at face value, I'll throw out something from a respected scholar in the field of, of gratitude. Um, I highly commend the work of this, this, this uh, gentleman. His name is Robert Emmons. He's PhD, he's a professor at UC Davis and a scientist, probably one of the leading experts on gratitude. He's a professor of psychology. Don't, don't hold that against him. He writes this, in our studies we've often, we often have people keep gratitude journals for just three weeks, and yet the results have been overwhelming. We've studied more than 1,000 people from ages eight to 80, and we found that people who practice gratitude consistently report a host of benefits. Physical, they have stronger immune systems. They're less bothered by aches and pains. Their blood pressures are lower. They exercise more, they take better care of themselves health-wise. They sleep longer and feel more refreshed upon waking. That sounds good, doesn't it? Psychologically, they have higher levels of positive emotions. They're more alert, they're more alive, they're more awake, they're more joyful, they're more, they, they have more pleasure in their lives. They're more optimistic, they're happier. And then at a social level, they're more helpful, they're more generous, they're more compassionate, they're more forgiving, they're more outgoing. They feel less lonely and less isolated. And this is just a group of people right? So how does gratitude do that? Well, this is his, his thesis, his four points, and he's, he, he's concluded that it, there are four ways in which gratitude does all these things. The first is that it allows us to celebrate the present right here, right now, to be thankful. And I don't know about you, but I spend about 50% of my my, my thought life in the past and about 50% in the present, so I very rarely live in the, I mean, I'm 50% in the future. I don't spend a lot of time in the present, and I think that's kind of what God's telling us today is that right now, experience the joy and the thankfulness that I have for you. Because right now is when we're living, right? So he goes on, research on emotion shows that positive emotions wear off quickly. Our emotional systems like newness. They like novelty. They like change. I remember the first time, this has nothing to do with the sermon, but I just remember the first time as a family we got a clicker, you know, for the TV, uh, remote, remote control. It was, this was a long time ago when they first came out. And my dad could click channels faster than anyone else, and he was the only one that had command of that uh, controller. So when he left the room, it was a battle on for the controller, but just, just changing channels, you know. That's just how, what we're, how we're wired. We adapt to positive life circumstances so that before too long, the new car, the new spouse, the new house, they don't feel so new and exciting anymore. But gratitude makes us appreciate the value of something. When we, and when we appreciate the value of something, we extract more benefits from it we're less likely to take it for granted. In effect, I think, he says, gratitude allows us to participate more in life as opposed to observing life. We notice the positives more and that magnifies the pleasures you get from life. Instead of adapting to goodness, we celebrate goodness. We spend so much time watching things, movies, <laughs> Netflix, Hulu, you name it, right? Computer screens, how much time have you faced a computer screen this week? Sports. But with that gratitude, we, became, we become greater participants in our lives as opposed to spectators. Secondly, he says, gratitude blocks toxic negative emotions. 
like envy, resentment, regret, emotions that can destroy our happiness. It also decreases the frequency and the intensity of episodes of depression. And this makes sense. You can't feel envious and grateful at the same time, can you? Try it. It can't be done. <laughs> They're incompatible feelings. If you're grateful, you can't resent someone for having something that you don't. Third, grateful people are more stress resistant. Another word for that would be resilient. And there are a number of studies that show that in the face of serious trauma, adversity, and suffering, if people have a grateful disposition, they'll recover much more quickly. Finally, he says, grateful people have a higher sense of self-worth, and by that he means when you're grateful, you have this sense that someone else is looking out for you. Isn't that awesome? Someone else has provided for your well-being. Now, this is a psychologist in Davis, right? He's probably not aware that we call that the doctrine of providence, <laughs> that there's somebody else that's always looking out for you, right? Someone else always has your best interest in his heart, and that's, that's our Father, Lord, our Father. And uh, so even a secular psychologist uh, can observe what God does through thankfulness. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 4, for it is for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving. So this is kind of how grace work, works. It increases thanksgiving. All to the glory of God. Back to that circular engine of our theology. In Psalms 50, David writes, the one who offers thanksgiving as his sacrifice glorifies me. So God is glorified in a mysterious way by our thanksgiving. Does God need me to say thank you? <laughs> Unlikely, but it's his will. He desires it. The Heidelberg Catechism is famous for its threefold outline of Christian theology. And this is, it's, it's kind of a, if you can remember anything, this is something to remember. Uh, guilt, grace, and gratitude, the three G's. I'll mention a few times in the sermon just so it kind of sticks, hopefully. Guilt, grace, and gratitude. If we're guilty sinners before God, we are guilty sinners before God. God saves us from guilt by his grace, and we respond to this grace with heartfelt gratitude. Heartfelt means real, authentic, not something we gen up because we're told to, or it's something good to do, or it's the right thing to do. That's, that's what we call false religion. Surface acts, God could care less about those. He wants to know what's going on right here. Have you ever had a get-together where the host goes around the circle, ask everyone to name one thing they're thankful for? I hate those groups, <laughs> honestly. Uh, I don't know why, but it's kind of like you're kind of forced to spit out something you're thankful for, and sometimes I, I feel like saying, I'm thankful this meeting's gonna be over soon, but that's probably not a very sanctified response. But no, we're talking about real thanks. The Anglican book, of, uh, common book of prayer, uh, has a prayer that starts this way. And we beseech thee, give us that due sense of all thy mercies, that our hearts may be unfeignedly thankful. We don't use that word anymore. But unfeignedly means authentic, real thankfulness. Not fake or phony thanks. God rejects phony thanks. But he's glorified by true thanks. Now, we're not naturally thankful creatures. We're born ingrates, so to speak. We're born <laughs> thinking about anything but thankfulness. Spend a few moments with any small child, if you've been a parent or if you are a parent, uh, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, and you'll be reminded how unnatural thankfulness is for infants. We used, Rhoda and I used to do the Pavlovian training of what do you say now? <laughs> You want that? When one of them, one of our children would ask for something when they were little, and what do you say, please? Okay, here you go. Now what do you say? 
What do you say? Okay, give it back. Let's try it again. What do you say? Okay, thank you. They have to be taught to say thank you. It's not natural. By our nature, it's really all about me. As a famous theologian, Toby Keith, put it, I want to talk about me. <laughs> you know the song, don't you? I want to talk about I. I want to talk about number one. Oh, my, me, my. What I think, what I like, what I know, what I want, what I see. I want to talk about me. And the Bible tells us as much in Romans 1, 20 through 21. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Everybody sees nature, right? Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power, and his divine nature. So they don't have any excuse for not knowing God. Yes, in verse 21, yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like, and as a result, their minds became dark and confused. Claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. So the psychologist recognizes some central truths about God and the experience of gratitude, but doesn't give credit to the creator, rather to his own intelligence and insight. Let's be real, even the pagans are thankful for turkey <laughs> in the holiday season, aren't they? But they're not thankful to the creator. They're not thankful to God. In our natural state, we're much like that, aren't we? In Luke 17, as Jesus continued on toward Jerusalem, he reached the border between Galilee and Samaria, the, the, kind of the no-go zone there. As he entered a village there, 10 men with leprosy, you know this story, 10 men with leprosy stood at a distance crying out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. He looked at them and said, go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed of their leprosy. One of them when he saw that he was healed, came back to Jesus shouting, praise God. He fell to the ground at Jesus' feet, recognizing that Jesus was God, thanking him for what he'd done. Now this man was a Samaritan. And Jesus asked, didn't I heal 10 men? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give glory, to give thanks to God except this foreigner? And Jesus said to the man, stand up and go. Your faith has healed you. Now Jesus could see that his thankfulness was from his heart. I mean, the man fell down to the ground. <laughs> he could see his praise was uncontainable and his joy unimaginable. Or the parable of the tax collector in Luke 18. It's kind of more like we are. When Jesus told this story, two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, and the other was a despised tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this. I thank you. There you go. Got off to a good start. I thank you, God, that I am not like other people. Cheaters, sinners, adulterers, I'm not like them. And I'm certainly not like this tax collector over here. I fast twice a week, and I give you a tenth of my income. Right? Obviously, he graduated from the Toby Keith School of Theology, didn't he? But the tax collector stood at a distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow. You can see a picture of this guy just wailing on himself saying, oh God, be merciful to me. He knew his sins. Be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. And I tell you, not the Pharisee, that the sinner, not the Pharisee, return home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. So we see here both the lone leper and the tax collector, their hearts, have been transformed by grace. 
Indeed, their hearts were overflowing with thankfulness. And that is today's message. Gospel transformation of necessity fills our hearts and souls with thanks. And from that comes joy and prayers of praise. Before I, most of you know, before I went into, or was called into ministry, I practiced medicine, family medicine for over 20 years. And as a medical student uh, studying cardiology, first couple years of medical school, one of the things that we had to do was listen to heart tones over and over and over and get audio tapes and listen to heart tones recorded and then go and put your stethoscope on a patient's chest and listen to heart, heart tones. And we'd listen to tapes of the normal ones and the abnormal ones, ones with murmurs and clicks, ones where the hearts were racing too fast or going too slow or irregular or skip beats. And if you listen to enough normal heartbeats, normal heart tones, it's easy to identify abnormal ones. And indeed, God identifies our heart tones. And to throw out one other cardiac physiology fact out, God made the heart with certain innate characteristics, one of which is called automaticity. The scientific definition, automaticity is defined as the ability of heart cells to spontaneously depolarize and generate an action potential. That science talk for the heart is programmed to beat. That's just what it does. Spontaneously. That's how grace works in our hearts. We become spontaneously thankful through the act of grace. Our Christian hearts are rewired, regenerated. Take your basic cup of coffee. You're sitting at a table with someone, walks along and bumps into the table. What comes out of the, what comes out of your, <laughs> what comes out? No, not, not that word, but uh, yeah, coffee. When someone bumps into us, does a spirit of thankfulness come out? Or might they hear something else? What vibe do we give off? And what drives this cycle? Well, a continuous recognition of what undeserving sinners we really are. Think for a moment about the word thanks or thankfulness. Where do you see it in the Old Testament the most? What book of the Old Testament do you, where we see thanks probably more than any other book? Right off the bat, Psalms. Why? Why do you think David talks about thanks so much? Well, this is my... My wild guess here um, is that David, perhaps as much as anyone else in the Old Testament, was aware of how deep his sins were and how horrifically he had wronged God and how helpless he was and lost. He writes in Psalm 51, For I know my transgressions, I know my sins, and my sin is always before me. So what David was saying there is, I never have forgotten what I've done. My guilt is always before me. And think about it for a minute. What did David do that was so bad? Well, he did a lot of stuff that was bad. He killed a man who was probably his most loyal officer, or at least secondhand, there was a second degree murder, homicide. Do you think that he thought about that? Do you think that he thought about Uriah's family? Uriah probably had parents and brothers and sisters. Do you think that went through David's mind? How about Bathsheba's family? Do you think David ever gave thought to how much he had wrecked her family? Her sisters, her brothers, her mom and dad? Or his own children? What legacy he gave to his own children or to his entire country? He was the king? No, David never forgot about that. That's why David was a thankful man. How about Paul? Every epistle of his is filled with thanks and praise for what God had done for him and for his beloved children. In the churches he served, do you think that Paul's sin was ever before him? Do you think he ever forgot 
about approving the execution by stoning of Stephen? Can you imagine how horrible it would be to see a man in a pit stoned to death? An innocent man at that? Or the screams of the men and women that Paul saw literally drug out of their houses to prison. I don't think Paul ever forgot those sounds. From the deep awareness of his own sin came the great thankfulness that was Paul's hallmark. Even when he himself was imprisoned. That's how grace works. Well, this verse ends by telling us that having an attitude of gratitude is God's will. It's what he himself creates in our hearts because we're new creations. Even in the hardest of hard times. And that's one reason why the prosperity gospel, so-called, is such a lie. It teaches that once we give our hearts to Jesus, everything will just be hunky-dory. Oh, if it were only so, but it's not. It teaches that health and wealth and even perfect teeth come along with being a Christian. I, 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 like, I like that guy's teeth. Um, we know different, don't we? God's permissive will allows for even sin to be used for good in our lives. And life is hard. It's really hard. Paul says that here, that God's will for us is to be thankful in all circumstances. You might ask yourself, how in the world can I be thankful in the midst of a trial, especially a painful trial? Uh, these last couple of weeks, I've been uh, on the phone quite a bit with one of my best friends whose wife, who is very healthy, uh, active, younger lady, uh, fine Christian woman. She was recently diagnosed out of the blue with an advanced cancer. It's hard to be thankful when you're taking chemotherapy that makes you feel sick. But times like those are where thankfulness is most needed. That's when we need it most because it leads to joy and resiliency. And we can be thankful that in trying circumstances, maybe you're going through those today, or will this week, because we know that our God doesn't make mistakes. There's nothing that falls outside of his sovereign eternal decree. As the hymn writer put it, whate'er my God ordains is right. We can be thankful that in trying circumstances, we can be thankful that in trying circumstances because it's better for us to be in a place of weakness. And this doesn't, this sounds counterintuitive, but it's better for us to be in a place of weakness that shows us our true need of God than to be in a place of plenty and prosperity and forget about him. Because when things are going great, who needs God, right? John Piper beautifully wrote this, gratitude is the echo of grace as it reverberates through the hollows of the human heart. And sometimes we do feel hollowed out, don't we? Empty. Sometimes it's because of hardship and sometimes it's just because we're people and we're just humans. There's a country song that goes this way. The, the sun is out, the sky is blue, there's not a cloud to spoil the view. But for some of us, it's raining, raining in my heart. Well, maybe you're worried about all the bad things I've already mentioned before that have occurred this year, or about the basics, getting older, losing your job, or hating your job, getting Alzheimer's, or being single, living with someone who's very hard to live with, we all have our panic buttons. Some, if you're like me, you're loaded with them. Paul suffered much more after he became a Christian and had his panic buttons pushed frequently, but he came out of those experiences with even greater thankfulness. In 2 Corinthians 1.8, he writes this, We think you ought to know, dear brothers and sisters, about the trouble we went through in the province of Asia. We were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure beyond our ability to endure. In other words, way past what we could handle, right? And though, and we thought we would never live through it, 
In fact, we expected to die. But as a result, we stopped relying on ourselves. And that's the key. We stop relying on ourselves and learn to rely only on God who raises the dead. And he did rescue us from moral danger and he will rescue us again. We have placed our confidence in him and he will continue to rescue us. Isn't that true? God will continue to rescue us. In verse 11 he writes, and you are helping us by praying for us then many people will give thanks because God has graciously answered so many prayers for our safety. You see, true religion is where gratitude is outward focused. We should be an outward focused people. It's really hard to be focused on our problems and our trials when we're focused outward toward others because Paul was continuously focused on us. Even in prison, his thoughts were on the churches. His thoughts were on his brothers and sisters in Christ. Cicero wrote, gratitude is not only the greatest of virtues, but the parent of all others. In closing, let's think about the act of Thanksgiving coming up this Thursday, right? Because our country has a great heritage of giving thanks. Most especially, thanks for the freedom of religion that we're practicing today. The national holiday was declared by Abraham Lincoln in 1863, but the first real Thanksgiving holiday was much earlier in 1623 with the pilgrims. Now, the first couple of years when the pilgrims hit the shores here, they wanted to go back because it was pretty barren. I think they end up in Plymouth Rock, Massachusetts somewhere. It was a pretty difficult place to start from scratch. But... <clears throat> In 1623, the governor of Massachusetts, a man named William Bradford, wrote this. He made the first Thanksgiving proclamation three years after they settled at Plymouth Rock. He writes like this. Inasmuch as the great father has given us this year an abundant harvest of Indian corn, wheat, peas, beans, squash, and garden vegetables, and has made the forest to abound with game, and the sea with fish and clams, and inasmuch as he has protected us from the ravages of the savages, and has spared us from pestilence and disease, has granted us freedom to worship God according to the dictates of our own conscience. Now I, your magistrate, do proclaim that all ye pilgrims, with your wives and ye little ones, do gather at ye meeting house on ye hill between the hours of nine and twelve in the daytime, on Thursday, November 29th, on the year of our Lord, 1,623, and the third year since ye pilgrims landed on ye pilgrim rock, there to listen to ye pastor, render thanksgiving to ye almighty God for all his blessings. Isn't that great? So today I'll close with a, with a prayer from, I should say a poem by George Herbert. Thou hast given so much to me, give one thing more, a grateful heart. Amen.